clearly the residents of this graveyard are skeptical of Periscope. But anyways, I want to say hello. I'm Andy Bachman. I work at the 92nd Street Y. And we're here this morning to visit some famous old New York Jews who are buried here, some of the leaders of the socialist movement here in New York. But I want to first start by just telling you a little bit about where you are. You're in the Mount Carmel Cemetery, which is off of the Cypress Hills exit and the Jackie Robinson Parkway here in Queens. Uh, it's one of the most important Jewish cemeteries in the entire United States because it has some of the founders of some of the most important ideas of New York Jewry that animated the lives of the more than three million people who migrated here from Eastern Europe between 1880 and 1920. One of the first things that Jewish communities did when they came to New York was they established what were called Landsmannschaft, and they were societies based on the similarities of the towns and the areas in Europe that people came from. And one of the first things they would do when they would establish a Landsmannschaft would be to, to create a burial society, a charity pot, they'd help people find jobs, they'd help people assimilate and acclimate to lives in America. And so these gates are something that you'll often see in Jewish cemeteries because they, they are a symbol of various towns that people came from actually in Europe. And so people would buy plots here in mass and then other people from those towns could have a sense of camaraderie and have a sense of home as they were building their new lives here in America, which is a story that we retell ourselves over and over and over again about the lives of immigrants. We're seeing now, for instance, uh, the largest wave of migration and refugees since the Second World War. So the immigration story and how people make their lives and remake their lives over and over through patterns of migration, we Jews have many interesting stories to tell as well. We have someone watching from Turkey. From Turkey right now. Well, hello, Turkey. Uh, uh, glad that you're watching right now and you're with us. So these, um, uh, I'm Andy Bachman, we're in the Mount Carmel Cemetery with the 92nd Street Y. We're learning about uh, the art of Jewish burial and seeing some famous Jewish figures from early New York history. So I want to show you a couple, uh, a couple traditional things that were uh, technically on Jewish gravestones. Um, Jewish burial and the art of Jewish burial, the customs of Jewish burial, goes back more than 2,000 years in our tradition. Uh, some of the customs that you're going to see as you're walking around and taking a look, you're going to see stones on graves. This is a sign that people have visited the graves. It goes all the way back to the uh, biblical book of Genesis where stones left at a site where someone has died as a memorial um, is a practice that we Jews um, still carry out to this day. I've got some stones in my pocket and we'll be leaving them at the graves of people um, as we visit them. Um, and so what I want to do for a kind of contrast is show you like what is a typical Jewish gravestone. So let's take a walk over here if we could. Um, and I want to show you that uh, in, in typical fashion, the way we tell the story on a gravestone, um, if we can just pan down here, I want to show you these letters, Pe Nun, means here lies, Ponik Bar. Um, and then we'll often tell the name of a person, um, and then we'll often tell their date of birth, their date of death. And then oftentimes uh, there will be what we call classical Jewish iconography or symbols. Uh, these are the open hands of the priest who uh, held his hands in this manner to bless the people. Um, and um, I see that someone in a comment said I look like Steve Jobs, and uh, that's nice. I've heard that before. You should see when my hair is even shorter. Um, but I'm far less wealthy, uh, at least in material matters. Nonetheless, um, and not as innovative as Steve Jobs, but we're not here to talk about him. Here's a menorah um, with five candles on it, representing the five books of the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Um, you'll see here, and then um, oftentimes you'll see a Star of David. Now, what you don't see specifically are images of faces or images of people, because uh, again, to quote the Torah, to quote the Bible, uh, it's very clear in the Ten Commandments that we're not meant to make graven images. Uh, the fear from the biblical perspective was that if you have a graven image of a, of a person, that person could then be worshipped. Well, here's what's interesting, and here's what's happened to, with the dawn of modernity, here's what happened to Jews first in Europe and then here in the United States. Uh, modernity really allowed people to ask a significant number of questions about their faith and whether or not they believed in literal interpretations of the Bible or whether or not they even believed in God. And so we're going to walk across the street to what's called Honor Row, 
you see in front of us on a row is the area here at Mount Carmel Cemetery where the, some of the founders of Jewish socialism and the Yiddish workers movement are buried most famously Sholem Aleichem the author uh, of the stories that the, the play and the movie Fiddler on the Roof were based on and we're going to visit a couple of other interesting people as well so let's walk on over um, I'll remind you uh, that I'm Andy Bachman from the 92nd Street Y and we're doing our periscope tour of the Mount Carmel Cemetery it's a beautiful November day uh, don't be afraid of cemeteries. They're really important places to visit. Uh, and um, if you've seen our town, you know how much uh, the dead like it when we visit them. Um, and so uh, I find it to be enormously meaningful to be in a place like this because it really creates these linkages to the past that I think are so important for, for our world. So this is the grave of... Uh, and uh, let me also remind you, uh, before I tell you about Sholem Aleichem, if you have questions, um, feel free to send them in. Uh, because we're happy to answer them while we're here um, this morning. Okay, so this is Sholem Aleichem. He's actually the first uh, person who's buried here, uh, most famously known as a comedic Yiddish writer, uh, was really truly seen as a writer of the people. Uh, he originates from Kiev uh, and then comes to the United States uh, to some degree against his will. He really flees to the United States to live with a greater degree of freedom. And one of the interesting things about Sholem Aleichem of course, we know this about him. Uh, wasn't really his name. Uh, I see Stuttgart, Germany is uh, following us, and that's awesome. Hello, Stuttgart. I have a friend who's from Stuttgart, and she claims that you guys invented pretzels. So I'm not sure if that's true, but maybe you can tell us if that's true. Um, so Shoah Malechem, as a great writer, um, wrote about himself in Yiddish here. Lots of times people would create their own epitaphs, and you'll notice there's no Star of David on this grave. You'll notice um, there's no menorah, there's no Kohanic hands, there's no priestly hands. This is really about uh, creating a new image for what it means uh, to be buried. And so here Sholem Aleichem writes a poem about himself. His wife Olga Rabinowitz uh, is uh, buried here as well. You'll see the number and the great variety of stones. This is a grave that's visited quite often. Um, and um, I want to also tell you that when Sholem Aleichem died, he was such a heroic figure uh, to the mass of Jewry, 250,000 people attended his uh, funeral and accompanied his body for burial. He was originally buried across the street um, and then was reinterred here. It's an interesting story because he died in the middle of the First World War. Yes, he is here. A lot of people are surprised when they hear that Sholem Aleichem is buried here, but you know, he is. Um, nevertheless, he died during the First World War. His wish and his will was to be buried back in Kiev but it was impossible to get his body back there. And by the time it w the war was over, um, it was very difficult uh, to put it, take his body back to Kiev uh, uh, because of the situation with a lot of Jews living under Soviet rule in the 1920s. And so kind of reluctantly and against uh, the family will, he was finally uh, 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 reinterred here just across the street from a different Jewish cemetery. But I want to bring you around to the other side and share with you something that's quite touching. Sholem Aleichem was though secular was was quite a traditionalist and so this other side of the grave whereas the front side is Yiddish and is about that view toward the new world and modernity and a new language the back side of the grave which I want to show you um, the poem he translated uh, from Yiddish back into Hebrew um, and um, this if you will is is uh, closer to a, a kind of more traditional uh, a more traditional Jewish gravestone and here's what he wrote about himself Sholem Aleichem um, um, uh, accompanied to his burial by over a hundred Yiddish writers from the Lower East Side um, in, uh, in 1916 and he wrote of himself, here lies a simple-hearted Jew in whose Yiddish women folk delighted and all the common people too laughed at the stories he indicted. Uh, he saw himself ultimately as a man of the people, though it is a massive gra uh, gravestone, um, there is a kind of wonderful humility uh, to who he really was. And if you just think of like the most stereotypical character, Tevye the Dairyman, a humble man, a working person, and you know, um, someone once said about Fiddler on the Roof that more than any other American musical, um, it's performed um, um, in enormous degree by the largest number of um, churches and, uh, and community theater groups, which is to say that there's a universality 
uh, to the story of immigration. There's a universality to the story of what families go through um, when modernity comes and when migrations begin. And I think that uh, he appealed obviously to the mass of Jewry and told their story, um, but also appeals to people from all backgrounds. So this is the great Sholem Aleichem. We're always so honored to uh, visit his grave. And so this is for you, Sholem. Uh, may you continue to rest in peace. So we're going to go visit some other people right us, now. The and um, the stones, um, uh, one of our questions asked, uh, you know, what do they remind us of? So going back to the uh, descriptions of early burials in Genesis, um, our biblical forefathers and mothers would make a pile of stones where someone was buried. And it would be a way to mark the grave. In fact, if you've ever traveled in the desert, and especially the desert um, in Israel, you can see um, uh, people will often leave piles of stones as a kind of marker. Um, before we even engrave them, they would be uh, left as a marker. You're wandering through and you want to remember where you were. Uh, and so stones are our way um, as, a, as, a, as a culture and as a people of, of noting to those uh, who have passed that we've come to visit. I just want to quickly say, um, since we mentioned Fiddler on the Roof, which of course is a famous Broadway show, um, uh, this is Sholem Aleichem's uh, granddaughter, Belle Kaufman, uh, a very important playwright who wrote uh, a very successful Broadway show called Up the Downstairs Case. So that's, she, as you can see, died just, uh, just about a year and a half ago. Okay, so we're going to walk over here. Um, and we're going to visit another very important figure. Um, and his name is Mayor London. Um, I was driving to the cemetery this morning, I saw someone had a bumper sticker, Feel the Burn, that's for Bernie Sanders. Everyone knows Bernie Sanders is this Brooklyn Jewish socialist, uh, senator from Vermont, and he's uh, running through the Democratic Party for president, he's a socialist, and he doesn't hide the fact that he's a socialist. Mayor London, whose grave you're seeing right now, was the first Jewish socialist representative in Congress, New York's first socialist representative in Congress followed Victor Berger, who is a, another Jewish socialist from Milwaukee, actually, the first uh, socialist member in Congress. Um, and Mayor London uh, came to New York uh, from Eastern Europe. Like a lot of these figures who are buried here, they came out of the yeshiva world. They, they came out of a traditional rabbinic-centric, faith-centric world. Uh, the cataclysms of change and modernity in Europe influenced them greatly. They took off their yarmulkes, they left religion behind, and they really saw the salvation of the world through uh, socialist politics and through socialism. So Mayor London followed his father to the Lower East Side, worked in sweatshops, and became very uh, sympathetic toward the plight of workers in New York, and then became a very important socialist. And you can see, no Hebrew, um, no classic Jewish iconography whatsoever, and a couple things worth pointing out. You'll see, um, for instance, the Torch of Freedom, uh, which should remind us, when we look at it, of the most famous torch, which is in New York Harbor, which is the Torch of the Statue of Liberty. So this is the light of freedom, uh, as opposed to across the way, there's no menorah here, there's no Star of David here, there's no priestly hands. This is, this is a kind of new story that American Jews are telling of themselves, the rising sun of a new world. You're going to see this a little bit further down when we visit Eight Consgrave, who founded the Forward newspaper. No Hebrew whatsoever, no Yiddish. And then the one uh, epitaph that Mayor London requested that he wrote, he devoted his life to the cause of the oppressed. Uh, Mayor London, uh, going against the Socialist Party, a bit of an iconoclast in his own right, he went against the Socialist Party at the urging of Woodrow Wilson, who persuaded Mayor London to actually support uh, the United States in the First World War. The Socialist Party was against intervention, and he made a very controversial decision to support uh, Woodrow Wilson in the war. Uh, he also pushed back against his party and his early support of Jewish settlement or Zionist settlement uh, in the land of Israel under the British Mandate period um, uh, in the first couple decades of the, uh, of the 20th century. So that's Mayor London, and a very, very important figure. And I want to show you the gate where we are. Um, and just stop to remind you, this is a Periscope tour in the 92nd Street Y. I'm Andy Bachman, and we're here in Mount Carmel Cemetery in Queens, which is exit three off the Jackie Robinson. Um, so again, apropos of what we had said earlier, so Hey, Alex, the ghost of Shalom Aleichem is holding the camera for your information. There we go. All right. Okay, Alex. So, um, uh, so this is the this is the gate of the Workman Circle. So. 
we were standing at a gate when we started this tour, so you'll notice again the symbolism. The AR in English, those letters on the world, stand for Arbeiter Ring, which is the exact Yiddish translation of the Workman's Circle. These are, these, are, these are highly literate Jews who saw themselves as creating a narrative of the redemption of the world through the equal rights of workers. And this is their gate, and it tells that story. So everyone you see, if you even pan around, everyone you see who is buried here paid dues to the workman's circle. And the dues got them various things, including the right to a burial plot here. And um, you'll look around, it's an incredible panoramic view um, to see the thousands of people um, who are buried here who are really part of the story of a kind of idealized vision of the new world. And the person who, um, who created that story probably better than anyone, um, and who was so vitally important to this narrative, was someone named Abe Kahn another Eastern European Jew, also comes out of a very traditional background, comes to the United States and um, famously founds the Forward newspaper. The Forward newspaper was the most highly circulating Yiddish daily. A number of Yiddish dailies were here uh, on the Lower East Side. Remember that number, three million Jews migrate to the United States between 1880 and 1920, coming uh, here and bringing with them varieties of traditions throughout uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe. Uh, and one of them was the Yiddish language, obviously. And the newspaper, the forward, forwards, you know, think about that socialist, uh, that socialist charge moving forward uh, to building a better world, a more just world, a more equal world. Uh, you'll again see here the rising sun of optimism on Abe Khan's grave. Doesn't even have his first name there, just simply says Khan. Um, and that's it. Very simple, like Sholem Aleichem, really, these, these people really saw themselves as the grand narrators of a whole new tradition. No Star of David, no menorah. You wouldn't even know that this is necessarily a Jew, except Kahan is actually also Cohen, uh, which means priest. So there is that kind of lineage that's in his name, but you'd have, to, you'd have to know something to know that. So here's what's interesting about Abe Kahn. So many interesting things to say about him. The foreword was, um, was the platform for people to talk about equal rights and socialism and equality. Uh, the foreword famously had a column called the Bintelbrief, where people could, it was a kind of a Jewish Dear Abbey, before there was Dear Abbey, where you could write in and you could ask, you know, my son just married a Gentile, does this mean that our family is going to lose its connection, or my daughter no longer wants to keep kosher, or, you know, how can I deal with this discrimination that I'm facing in the job, and it was an advice column that was, uh, that was dispensed um, uh, on the pages of the foreword. And the, the specific language, I love this about uh, this story about Abe Khan. He, he famously said that he wanted the newspaper to be written in a style of Yiddish that would ultimately encourage his readers to speak English. What he really felt with you know, his view of, of the possibility for life in America, he really felt that um, America offered an incredible opportunity for Jews to live in freedom and in equality. And so the Yiddish in the paper itself was meant to really aid that process of acculturation and assimilation. It's a very interesting fact because today uh, the, the forward is still published. It's still published in print. It's read more online. Um, but its circulation is, in English is vastly greater than its circulation in Yiddish. Very few people, certainly in the secular context, read or speak Yiddish in the United States. In the Haredi or the ultra-Orthodox world, a number of people, obviously thousands, still speak Yiddish, both here and in Israel, across Europe where Hasidic communities live. They really have become the holders of uh, the Yiddish language. A hundred years ago, it was uh, many people, uh, many people that you see here. I want to tell you one more story uh, because it's also one of the most interesting graves here, and it's that of um, uh, it's uh, Aaron Shmuel Lieberman, uh, who really people say was the leader of Jewish socialism in Europe, and uh, you'll notice immediately uh, that uh, these socialists who were iconoclastic in their own rights um, made their own made their own icons of themselves. So, in distinct uh, disobedience toward the commandment of not making a graven image, look at this bust of Aaron Shmuel Lieberman. He looks like Herzl. He, uh, Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism, who also sported a very large beard. He looks like Moses. He looks like Abraham. I'm not quite sure Moses or Abraham would have had such a sculpted mustache. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Lieberman, um, why did he wind up here? 
um, and how did he die here? Very interesting, tragic story. A prolific writer and organizer of Jewish socialist ideas in Europe, um, and like many uh, of those who um, espouse iconoclastic ideas, um, uh, Lieberman uh, had a lover, and he followed her uh, to the United States, left his family behind, and when he got here thinking that he'd be able to start his life anew, um, she told him, no, that's it, the relationship is over, um, I'm staying with my family here, go back to your family, but you certainly can't be with me. And tragically, uh, let, fewer than, than on six months after his arrival, uh, he committed suicide in Syracuse. And uh, from a broken heart, uh, ended his crusade for building a world of justice and freedom. So love conquers all, and in Lieberman's case, uh, it was a uh, broken heart was the cause of taking his own life. So um, we're going to leave stones in these various places. Uh, one for Aaron Shmuel Lieberman. Uh, we're going to leave a stone for him, uh, and one for Abe Khan. Um, I will uh, say that uh, the forward is a paper uh, that I continue to read uh, on a on a daily basis. I read the forward. I read Tablet Magazine. Uh, the idea of continuing to read uh, Jewish periodicals on a daily basis is still with us. But both are outlets that uh, you know that we read in English, and uh, this is an example, in a way, of this ever-evolving story that we that we talk about. There are customs that we maintain, uh, and there are customs that change. And perhaps there's no greater place to think about that than to come to a cemetery, to think about our linkages to the past, where we are in the present, and what the future may hold. And I've always believed that if we continue to visit and continue to tell stories, that um, uh, we can link ourselves to other cultures that do similar things uh, and maintain our own place uh, and uh, distinct ways in the world. So this was Andy Bachman. That's who I am. This was a Periscope tour. And yes, Kathy, uh, yes. please follow us on Periscope. We'd love that. All right, cool. So it was great to be with you. And uh, Kathy says this was excellent. Oh, Thank good. You. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, on a different day, we're going to hop in the car and jump across the street and visit Harry Houdini or the Marx Brothers' parents. Or if you like this, let us know, because uh, there are lots, uh, lots of amazing people to visit and great stories to tell. So please follow us uh, and let us know what you thought. Thanks a lot.